Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Bruce Sinclair. Mimosa, who had their mimosa? Me? No, I didn't have the mimosa. I just had the big cookie. So in probably around 20 minutes, I'm going to be a little bit tired, maybe a little bit dozy. But good thing is, I'm not right now. So coming up, we've got, let's make sure I get this right, not all IoT networks are created equal. Driving connectivity for the durable IoT. And with us presenting is Michael Bell. He's the president and CEO and board member of Silver Spring Networks. Please give uh, Michael a hand of applause. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have the coveted after lunch spot, like, which I guess is before the spot where everybody's dying to get to lunch. But I uh, wanted to welcome everybody again. And I'm here to talk to you today about uh, Silver Spring Networks, what we do, what we've done, and the larger role we intend to play in the wider area, Internet of Things space. Before I start that, I have uh, two pieces of uh, well, one piece of housekeeping I have to get through. It turns out when you're CEO of a public company, the lawyers make you put this up. Trust me, it's all good. Just ignore it. Um, the second thing before I start, I'll say is a little bit of an editorial. Um, I've been working in the IoT space before it was called the IoT space. And I've noticed, I'm sure like many of you have done recently, that in the press, IoT is seeing a bit of a headwind. Things like this on courts, you know, the Internet of Things being dead. And, and you know, it, it struck me that there are really two reasons for this. The first one, I'd say, is a little self-inflicted. I call it the Bluetooth dilemma. And for those of you who remember Bluetooth back in the early 2000s, every year it was going to be the next big thing. The number of devices that were going to be connected grew exponentially every six months. Uh, the Bluetooth SIG held events in Monte Carlo with Cirque du Soleil. It was phenomenal. Uh, they showed Bluetooth-connected soda machines. Finally, everyone put Bluetooth in the car, and it took off and became the thing we all knew it would be. So to some extent, my message is please get out there and start building and shipping things, and let's stop talking about it, and let's start doing it. Um, because I know I as I talk to the press, there's some skepticism. I'm a huge believer that IoT is really here and, and is actually going to be even bigger. But we have to really start reinforcing and making this thing real. Second thing, and, and you know, this again is not a surprise to anyone here in the audience, but we all talk about IoT like it's one monolithic thing. And certainly this is the way I've always looked at the IoT uh, space and the possibilities that we have. And you know, it strikes me that the thing that the press picks up on right now are the, the uh, products that are in the two most difficult spaces to succeed in, consumer IoT and the wearable space. So I have to say, you know, my, my group back at Apple uh, a long time ago built the first Wi-Fi products. It was very, very difficult to make something work for everyone 100% of the time. There are always going to be hiccups. And in the, the consumer space, I love the devices that are out there. I think that some of the things are really showing promise. But when you talk about wearables, there's this fashion element. It's not just a matter of does a device work or solve a problem. It has to actually look good, and everyone's definition of look good is a little different. So I'm going to pivot this and talk about what we do. It turns out that uh, when I joined Silver Spring, I like to tell people that it's the biggest IoT company that no one's ever heard of. In fact, I'm sure a bunch of people are out there in the audience saying, who are these guys? Um, to make a very long story short, we have been doing for the past ooh, over 10 years what I like to call the internet of critical things. We have been serving as the infrastructure provider for many of the utilities and smart cities that you all know. PG&E in California has our meters from the, has our technology in their meters and other infrastructure from the Oregon coast down to San Luis Obispo. We just recently won a deal with Con Ed to supply infrastructure for smart cities and for, IO, for um, uh, smart energy for all of New York City. ComEd in Chicago, FPL in Florida. We have iconic customers all over the globe. No one's ever heard of us because for some reason, 
people think of machine to machine IoT as sort of the less sexy thing, and we haven't gotten as much press. But let me tell you what we've been doing. We have 23.6 million active IoT devices running on any given day. From the beginning of the company, the network has been an IPv6 completely open standards-based YSUN network. And we're gonna come back to that in a minute, but let me keep going. Our coverage is over 1.5 million square miles, over 60 million people are covered at the moment. We do 600 million daily record reads from our devices in the field, which is about 220 billion a year. And because we're servicing customers that it matters if this stuff goes down, distribution automation, other things on the electric grid and in smart cities, we have to have crazy high reliability. So our, our uptime is over 99%. And for many of our customers, we have service level agreements that specify we have to have this high level of service. So again, you've never heard of us, but if you live in one of the areas that we, uh, that we service, if you go out and look at your electric meter, you're gonna see our name on it. One of the other things I didn't mention is that our network has been built for highly reliable IoT from the beginning. So not only are we standards based, we also use a technology called mesh. The idea here is that the more devices you add to the network, the more reliable the network becomes. And the network has, all the devices in the network have multiple ways to get out of the network and get their data to where, they, where it needs to go. So why is that important? Well, when you're serving the electric grid in Chicago and you have a lightning strike that takes out one of your access points, it's important that the network still runs. The reliability has to be there even, even in extreme conditions. And this is one of the things that I love to show. This is one of our customers, uh, a prize for someone who recognizes Diamond Head, um, Hawaiian Electric. We actually have a network running on the island of Oahu. And as you can sort of see here, our technology, because it uses a mesh and it's not simple point to point, is able to actually see around the volcano. And if one or more of these access points go down, the network is self-healing reforms itself immediately and keeps on operating at the high level of reliability that we're bound to. We are firm believers that a modern IoT network has to be mesh-based, no doubt about it. So let's take a look at sort of the, the field at the moment. This is the way I describe it to people. I, I do this talk a lot uh, to the press because there's a lot of press about these sort of low power, wide area networks that are popping up. They're trying to get a lot of press. Um, it's, it's interesting to me. Um, we believe that you have to have mesh, that you have to have megabits per second speed because who would roll out an IoT network now that's, that's already essentially has no headroom to grow? It has to have low latency and it also has to have the ability to scale from lower cost devices to higher cost, higher reliability, perhaps intelligence at the edge devices. This is what the YSUN standard that we use provides. Now, the interesting thing here is that people often say, well, you guys are competing with cellular. We're not. Um, the YSUN mesh approach is a fantastic adjunct to cellular. We use cellular as the backhaul in many cases to take data off our network and get it back to the data centers where it needs to go. And in fact, we are able to aggregate tens of thousands of devices behind a single access point that then uses one cellular, net, uh, cellular network connection to get data back, which means we're not clogging the cellular networks with millions and millions of connections that are just parked there, sending very little bits of data. So I wanna talk about standards for a second. Um, part of what makes our technology really attractive to our customers, other than the fact that we have a great track record and it has high performance and it has low latency and it has high reliability, is that we're not boxing them in to a, to a homegrown technology uh, without, uh, without people who can uh, keep the standard going or provide uh, additional products that, aren't, that don't come from us. You know, we don't, they don't wanna be boxed into a single provider. We think having a YSUN standard or having a standards-based protocol is critical. The graveyard of networking technology is littered with people who created proprietary standards that got a little bit of noise for a while and then died. Standards are always going to win. So, I love saying this, and it's a little self-serving. Take a look what Machina Research says. 
I won't read the slide, you can all read it. But the point here is that the internet has, told us time, has shown us time and time again that the standards-based approaches are going to win. And in fact, one of the other interesting things about our network, being that it's based on IPv6, and it's not a meter network, or it's not a network for a specific technology, is even customers who rolled our technology out back in 2009, 2010, 2011, are able to connect new devices to their network as the need comes about. Their network is essentially future-proofed because we're using the same standards that the internet is based on. So today, when customers roll out our network, you don't have to decide, wow, I'm gonna do these five things with it and you're gonna be locked in forever. It really is future-proofed and this is an important thing. Now, what are we up to? We've decided that we're going to take the same reliable technology that we've made available to smart cities and utilities and to make it available to the wider IoT market. We call this effort Starfish because of course we had to come up with a fun name, calling it the Silver Spring Wide Area IoT Network Initiative doesn't quite have that ring. So we called it Starfish. And what we're in the process of doing is putting together developer kits, developer documentation, developer kitchens uh, to introduce people to our technology. We're gonna be distributing to partners who come sign up with us. This is our little battery powered module that connects devices to our, to our network. We will be providing developer kits, developer documentation and help to get folks onto our network. And in fact, one of the things that I've found over the years is if you wanna roll out a new initiative like this, you have to make it pretty frictionless for people to use your technology. So one of the things we're doing is something we call the Haiku service. Um, there are uh, some alternative services that limit you to something like 10, 16 byte data transfers a day or something like that, which seems kind of crazy to me. We essentially are giving that away for free. That's our Haiku service. The concept here is get our developer kits, give it a try, see if you like it, build out your example without giving us a credit card. If well, that's all the data you need, guess what, it's free. Our network is so good, we can handle that, with it. it can handle that without breaking a sweat. If, however, you would then like to have the ability to use higher data rates, more guaranteed delivery, guaranteed levels of service, we'll have a tiered data plan on top of that. We think that we have a technology that's not only the right thing and that it's standards-based, but that it's proven, and that's a lot. And this, as we roll this out more and more, we think the advantages will become even more clear. So I'm gonna end on that note. What I'd like you to do, uh, if you'd like to see more of what we're doing, down in our booth, we have examples of all the thing, the technologies that we've rolled out. So already we are doing, as I mentioned, meters and distribution automation for the electric grid. On top of that, we're doing smart cities, we're doing street lights, we're doing public safety. In our booth, which I guess opens tomorrow, I was surprised to find that out, um, you'll see examples of all this stuff up live and running. It's not slideware, it's not a brochure that you have to sort of take on faith. You can see it all up and running. For those of you who are building devices, please sign up for our developer events. Let us show you how great our network is and we welcome everybody to be part of making this Internet of Things space really take off in the way we know it all can actually happen. So thank you very much. All right, Michael, so I'm a big fan of standards, and I think if anyone saw my presentation earlier this morning, it is one of the hurdles. And I just want to just put a finer point on it. Um, Michael's presentation was on the network layer, right? So we have below that, we've got the media layer, and that's where we have our radios, our Bluetooths, our Wi-Fis, our LPWAs. And above that, we have our application, above the uh, networking layer, where Michael's playing with IPv6, we have the application pro uh, protocol layer. And this is what contextualizes the data. So just a small note, because sometimes when people talk about the standardization in the Internet of Things, they conflate them all together. There's really three. And if there's one that you really can standardize, it is on IPv6. And um, so I think he's on the right track.